So is there, uh, but first of all, just to be, make you all aware of this, the speakers in this room are not working, so I'll, I'll try to pitch it up a bit. Um, am I the last speaker before drinks somewhere? Is that what's going on? Okay, cool. All right. I, I promise this won't be a four-hour session, uh, although it says so right in the, in the, you know, the program that this is going to be four hours long. So, and the doors are locked, so if you had to go to the bathroom, you missed it. Uh, in any case, my name is Mark Seward. I'm uh, director of, uh, of uh, well, what am I now? Director of Public Sector Marketing for uh, Splunk. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, cybersecurity professionals and old paradigms that uh, big cha data changes uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, how many people are security professionals in the room or people who deal with security on a regular basis? Almost everybody? Okay. And just for those that aren't, I do have some consolation slides later in the deck. Uh, so if you sit through the security part, I'll talk about some other kinds of use cases for big data as well. So here are the old paradigms. Um, and these are the ones in probably seven or eight years of being a, a security professional, being a, uh, a, a, in, the, in the business that I run across every day. Uh, and um, the first one is uh, pretty interesting because when I talk to uh, cybersecurity professionals, most of them are inundated with alerts, with things they need to do, um, and basically what they're doing is they're leaning on their, their vendor to tell them what to do. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, but, but uh, frankly, being told what my security, uh, what I should be looking for by my, by my vendor is really not working for me because what happens is, uh, you know, most of their experience is about a year old. Uh, and they're chasing after threats that, that came about about a year ago. So they're solving uh, a year ago's problems with answers that are, that are a little bit old. Um, also, there's a bit of what I call vendor fatigue uh, that happens, uh, where basically, because the vendor is telling you what your cybersecurity posture needs to be, that uh, you're, you get into sort of a sense of complacency, where you don't really think as much as you should. So we'll talk a little bit about that more in depth. Um, monitoring the perimeter is enough. Um, uh, we've all known that this is really not, uh, not a good way to go anymore. There are too many avenues through which um, uh, viruses uh, and, and malware can in, infiltrate your organizations. And it's just sim not simply good enough to monitor the perimeter. Um, you know, I don't know how widespread uh, Bring Your Own Device or BYOD is with the state government, but I do know that there are plenty of vendors out there supplying solutions, remote solutions, for iPad, for the phone, for all kinds of mobile devices. So whether you subscribe as a state government to BYOD or not, you're going to be drug into that because the vendors are going to pull you there with what they would call um, time-saving ways to interact with different systems. Uh, I saw a slide the other day of, uh, uh, of a screenshot of an iPad that was, had remote software on it that could basically control a, an entire substation, an electrical substation. So uh, the vendors are actually moving that direction. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but, but uh, on the Amazon uh, App Store, uh, there were over 60 apps that were removed lately because of the fact that they were simply malware. Um, uh, disguised as other things, of course. So when the vendor makes some sort of an app that's going to control uh, our lives, li literally my electricity, and puts it on an iPad, um, I, that's kind of a big risk. So whether, you, whether you're thinking BYOD or not, that's, that's, uh, the perimeter simply isn't enough anymore. Um, I have enough context to make smart security decisions. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, are grabbing data from Active Directory from databases that are out there that we can get to uh, about assets. But uh, we need to start thinking beyond that to behaviors. And uh, I'll talk about what that means in a moment. And then the last one is, um, I've got these guys over here. They're called IT operations, and they're really separate from me. Uh, especially in government, availability of services to the public is everything. And availability is a security uh, issue as much as it, is, as it is an IT operations or application management issue. So those are the four paradigms, and we're going to jump into those um, a little bit later. But first, I want to just sort of talk about what's going on uh, outside of, out, in the outside world, outside of this room, and the fact that we've got uh, a lot of advanced threats out there that are extremely hard to detect. Um, 
And this was a this is information from uh, Mandian's M Trends reports from 2012, 2013, and they talk basically about the fact that in 100% of cases where there were um, uh, where there was data stolen, where there was a security breach, a data breach, 100% um, of the time valid credentials were used. So it's not like they're trying to really brute force their way in. They're figuring, figuring out ways to get the data from someone inside of the organization, uh, someone who has access, uh, admin access, for example, someone who has uh, credentials that they can use to, uh, to steal things. Um, there's about 243 days before detection. That's the median. So there were a lot of uh, data breaches that took longer to address before they were detected. But uh, this is actually better than last year's number. Last year was in the 300s. So um, we are getting better, but, but not really that good. So it's, it's taking a long time to find this stuff. Um, 40 systems, on average, are, are accessed. Uh, and um, that's, uh, uh, that's not a lot. But uh, the attackers are getting a lot better at targeting uh, what they want. For example, um, they're beginning to understand by going and, and uh, going to a place where they can grab a network diagram, they're figuring out where uh, custom code is being written or they're figuring out where, uh, where the net network diagram itself is, which describes the entire environment for them to play in. So those systems that they do attack are the ones that contain a lot of important information that they can use to, to, to cause a data breach. And then 63% uh, of the time, those victims of a data breach, those organizations that were breached, were actually uh, notified by an external entity. Um, that's kind of scary. Uh, especially when it's the FBI that comes to the door and says, hey, um, we think you've been hacked. Uh, and that's, that's exactly the, the phrase you don't want to hear almost more than we're here to help you, uh, is the phrase, uh, you, we think you've been hacked. Um, these are some of my favorite, um, if you can call them that, my favorite data breaches that are out there. Um, I was just in another session uh, listening to somebody talk about South Carolina's, uh, which... Um, Actually, most of you are probably familiar with. Um, I wasn't as familiar with uh, the Utah data breach. It was uh, uh, 780,000 citizens um, basically uh, broke into the server, took a lot of personal data from the state of Utah. And then my all-time favorite is the one from New Hampshire, where the corrections department uh, figured out that inmates were able to access the main offender management database system. And they were able to actually get and see records uh, uh, on, uh, on the people who work there. So the inmates suddenly know a lot about the personal lives of all the people who are guarding them. Uh, and, and frankly, that's, that's not, not a good thing. Uh, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of a crazy one. Well, I was going to focus not necessarily on, on commercial side, but on the government side since I'm here at, the, at a state conference. But um, uh, Targets uh, is, is top of mind for everybody. Um, actually, that was a very complicated uh, br data breach they pulled off. Um, 70 million records plus. Uh, they're still sort of counting up the records as they go. Um, basically, the problem was that uh, the, the hackers were actually able to access the uh, OS, the operating system of the little red box where you swipe your credit card inside the, uh, uh, inside the Target store. Uh, and then they were actually able to take that information off of there uh, one record at a time and collect it over a period of time, over a series of months. You can imagine the number of transactions that were, uh, that were, uh, that were funneled through those devices uh, over the Christmas season. <coughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's getting worse and worse. But thank you for bringing that up because it, it's, uh, it, it just points up wherever there's a way for, uh, where there, wherever there's an interface between me as a citizen and someone who wants my personal data either to purchase something or so that I can get services, that's the point at which um, there's a lot of risk. Um, a lot of times it's the people that are the weakest link in, uh, in our data protection strategies. And uh, basically, um, I'm, I can be fished, uh, I can be persuaded, I can be coerced to hand over information that will allow an, att an attacker to attack a system. Uh, and so we're all vulnerable to trust issues. And it only takes one time to be right. And um, employees' uh, activities, um, uh, once credentialed, are usually trusted. So if I, just going back to that earlier slide, if 
100% of the time, uh, credentials, proper credentials are used to gain data. Typically, I'm not, as a security profession, professional, not paying as much attention to that kind of thing uh, as I need to be now. Um, I need to be able to look at all of the credentialed activity as well as all of the activity where I've got attackers trying to attack the perimeter of my website uh, to know whether or not I've got anomalous behavior that's going on. Uh, and we'll talk about what those anomalous behaviors might look like uh, a bit later. And we really need to be able to collect all of this data and more, uh, and I'll also describe what and more looks like, uh, to really take a look at threats that we have to our environment, both at a, on the commercial side and at the state and local government level. Um, they're also successful because of uh, a strategy that uh, many of the vendors used uh, since the 1990s. Uh, it's a data reduction strategy where basically, um, in particularly in the SIM uh, security information event management uh, uh, vendors world, where they have a list of different data types that you can collect that fit their particular schema. Uh, and those data types are normalized, so some of that data is rolling off and you're never going to see that data. And then you're only really working with the metadata of a subset of devices that they can actually handle inside of a database schema itself. And that basically presents sort of a, a homogenized milk or a skim milk kind of view in my mind of, of security. Um, believe it or not, anybody ever looked at uh, log data um, in depth, folks in the room? All right, so some of you probably have seen log data from applications in particular. And there's not, all, all, not just ASCII text in there that is human readable. But there's all kinds of punctuation. There's all kinds of very interesting types of data in there that really uh, are simply uh, placeholders inside of the data. And when I reduce the data and I basically normalize out all of that punctuation, I reduce my ability to be able to understand whether or not a new application or a new version of an application has been rolled into production uh, out of sequence or out of order or ahead of its time. Or I reduce my ability to say take, at, take a look at a, a counterfeit uh, Cisco ver a version of Cisco IOS and compare the log data from it to a regular version of Cisco IOS where all of the metadata would be the same but punctuation in that what that might uniquely fingerprint that iOS is now missing. So data reduction really has some pitfalls and has had for a long time. Uh, it's just that, just like me, when I was uh, running a, a sim, I was actually very grateful because what it did was it reduced the amount of data I was going to have to look at and it made it a lot easier for me to, to do my job. What I really wasn't thinking about is the fact that I was really only getting the vendor's view of the data that I was going to be looking at. I really couldn't follow an investigation to, it, to the nth degree, to its end, because of that normalization. Finally, it really had, it hampered my ability to go back and do cold cases. Because in this world, you collect the data, you normalize the data, you put the data into a database where you can report on it, and then you can alert on it. So if I get an alert um, that I had, say I had an infection in my, in my environment, I would go back and I could do an investigation on the, on the infection based on the data that was there. But if somebody walked up to me, and people did this, somebody walked up to me uh, six weeks later after I got an alert uh, indicating I had a virus outbreak and said, um, we, uh, we, we know you weren't collecting data from these other hundred systems, um, but we'd like you to stick that in here to see whether or not this outbreak is still occurring uh, amongst these devices. We've had some performance degradation amongst these and we really would like you to take a look at it. And that's when I would go and sort of bang my head against a wall because really um, the sim sims are not built for cold case investigations. I can't take new data and add it to old data to see if my conclusions might change. Uh, it's a very serial process in, in a sim environment. So that's, that's the, other, the other major problem with why some attacks are successful is that I can't quite get to root cause. I can't quite get to that last degree to find out what happened. And then finally, um, you know, uh, we're all siloed off from each other. Uh, somebody talked about the fact that um, uh, in the other session, basically, that 
uh, what big data is doing is really breaking down silos between IT operations, between uh, IT operations and security and application management in particular, and even web analytics to a certain extent, where I can begin to see all of this data together and I can begin to decide for myself what b might be relevant for my particular use case. It also helps when I've got a problem that 100 servers spike to 95% CPU utilization all in five minutes, and I have to figure out, is this an IT operations issue or is this a security issue? It's beginning to not matter. What's real, what really matters is it's a service issue. It's a service availability issue to the public, to a commercial entity, to whomever. And so breaking down those silos helps with determining much more quickly, uh, much faster, what the root cause is and whether or not I, can, I should be the one addressing it or it should be my IT operations brethren. Um, I also uh, hearken back to uh, uh, a talk that uh, the CISO of eBay gave where he talked about the fact that he had an assistant that came up to him with a laptop that was acting kind of strange. And uh, he said, um, yeah, you know, okay, that's great. Give it to the IT guys and, uh, and let them sort of take a look at it. And sure enough, they, she gave it to the IT security guys and they found a virus on it. They, like right away, they found a virus on it and gave it back to her. They sort of raised the flag of victory and she went on with her life. Two weeks later, she comes back to the, to the CISO and says, there's really something wrong with this. And, and this is the person who controls his schedule, knows where he's going, um, uh, knows a lot about him. This is his assistant. And he says, you know what? Give me the laptop. I'm going to take it to, I've got this crack team of five guys who sort of look at this stuff. And, and he handed it off to them. And she got it back about three hours later. And it turned out that the same team that had written that malicious piece of malware that was found immediately also wrote another piece of malware that was much more complex, much more complicated. And they simply wrote that simple piece of malware on there to misdirect the investigation to make sure that these guys simply, because it, the attack how busy everybody is, right? To say, okay, here's a sacrificial lamb. We don't want them to find this. We want something easy on there that would allow for this, our malware, the malware we actually care about, to continue to function so we can learn more about the CISO. You know, um, and, uh, and uh, all of you familiar with Kevin Mandian? I, I, I had a discussion with him the other day. He, the, the Mandian report, Many report was the one about the, the Chinese hackers and um, he basically identified uh, their unit and their building where they were, where they were hacking from. Um, you know, no, no report like that goes without consequences. And he was saying that what happened to him was kind of interesting. The, the Chinese hackers attacked him personally. And what they did was they basically started sending him um, bogus limousine bills that had malware in them that looked legitimate. They figured out you know, what kind of limousine service he was taking and they sent bogus bills. So basically this assistant to the eBay uh, CISO who knows what kind of limousine service he takes, knows his travel schedule, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, that's, that's one way for somebody to be able to basically attack you is by putting malware in those bills in, that end up on your, uh, on your assistant's computer or on your own. Uh, so there's plenty of ways that, um, that opponents are now basically saying, hey, look over there. Uh, we fooled you, didn't we? That kind of thing. So I'm going to dive a little bit of, into paradigm number one, if you remember what that was. It's I need my security to vendor to tell me um, what to do. And uh, on the SIM side, the problem with that is basically that you've got um, uh, the SIM vendors, they have 300 exact match rules um, that are sold to every customer in a business vertical. It's sort of like taking a rod and reel and uh, throwing hooks over the side and hoping that every single fish in the sea attacks those hooks regardless of how big or how small they are. And that's kind of, that's kind of uh, wishful thinking because if you've got a small hook out there and you've got a shark, uh, it may not attack that at all. It may just circle around and attach itself to, uh, to your boat looking for, looking for cracks in the hull to try to get data out of. So that's, that's basically the sim is those, those rules that they peddle to every vertical um, for every situation and every sale are those same sets of hooks. And the threats are not 
all, they're only, they're, they're more than 300 threats in the world. There are thousands and thousands and millions and millions of different combinations that are, that are built by extremely creative people. Um, as I mentioned before, vendors lag the problem by six months to a year, depending on development cycles. Um, so they, and they really don't deal with things until they're pervasive. So you need a, a way to deal with things on your own terms, to be able to look at data yourself and figure out, if, is this normal or not? And then, of course, you get the, the lazy security guy who, you know, through no fault of his own, is overworked and is basically looking at hundreds of thousands of issues and is having to select which ones to tackle and is dependent on a tool to tell him, okay, tackle these things. Um, and they get to that point where basically they've forgotten why they got into the business, where um, they were all excited when they got out of college or they got, got, were all excited when they got out of training and that's beaten out of them over time by the real world. And so when I talk to security professionals about this and I say, you know, why did you get into this business originally? And I, most of the time I get an answer like, oh, I watched too many Columbo episodes. Or I really wanted to understand what was going on. Or I wanted to solve crimes, uh, cyber crimes. And, they, and their eyes begin to light up when they remember uh, back to those days. And I said, well, is a vendor handing you an answer to a solution actually that? Is it, is it that thing? Is it, is, it, uh, is it the thing that you got into this business for? And when, as soon as they begin to associate what they've been doing with what they got into the business for, they realize they need some kind of new solution. Um, the perimeter, uh, as I mentioned, uh, BYOD is commonplace. 75% of AT&T mobile phone customers use their phone to access corporate networks at least once a day. Uh, I don't know if that's prevalent in, it's certainly prevalent in the commercial world. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's now prevalent in uh, state and local as well. Um, so that basically access to data is pretty much everywhere. There's really no perimeter. Uh, and there's, uh, and I mentioned uh, vendors that are creating mobile versions of their products specifically for this. And infections can be picked up uh, virtually anywhere. Virtually anywhere. Um, do I have enough context to make smart decisions? Um, being able to collect any kind of data and run analytics on it gives you a lot of power that you really don't think about the extent of until you sort of start taking stock of what you have. Um, asset databases really give you good insight into assets, but behaviors of people are a little bit different. Um, and I talk to, uh, on the federal side, government contractors who build a, have a, a list of all of the employees that are, whose projects are ending, or a pink slip list, for example. And uh, they keep that on hand, and then they compare that list against information about large file transfers that are coming out of the organization by those individuals to uh, Dropbox or Box or to, um, uh, to Gmail, those kinds of things. They monitor that. So they're taking a look at at-risk employees, employees whose projects are ending, and being able to monitor their behavior to understand what's going on. They also look at vacation records. People who haven't taken vacation in two years are hiding something. That, I mean, th this, is, uh, this is what psychology today tells us, tells us uh, is that basically people who haven't taken a vacation in a couple of years should be suspect um, because they want to remain in control of what's going on. They don't want to hand over control of their projects to other people for fear that they might be discovered. So take a look and associate data activities, activities that those employees are performing in data with the context of whether or not they're taking a vacation or they're on a pink slip lift, li list. Um, changes in the ratios of the different types of websites that I surf to uh, is an interesting way to sort of track employee behavior. Because you're not really tracking what websites the employee goes to if they have, if they have internet access. What you're doing is you're saying, hmm, you know, 10% of the time this guy was surfing to guns and ammo, and now 85% of the time they're surfing to that, um, or 25% of the time they surfed to uh, some sort of a relocation site, and now that's gone up dramatically. And you, be, you can begin to profile, and I use the word carefully, profile an employee's behavior based on the types of websites they surf to, not necessarily what specific website they surf to. 
And that's also being used on the federal level uh, in tracking employee behavior, those employees that handle sensitive data. Um, things like changes in a personal life. Uh, those are the most stressful times that we have as individuals. Um, so when we want to understand the behavior of employees, has this employee's address changed three times in a year? Has this employee uh, gone through, is, go, is that employee going through a, uh, a marital change or, or a relationship change? Um, those kinds of events also, according to psychology today, are the ones that trigger insider theft and fraud. So seeing data in context is, uh, is helpful. Um, I've also talked to folks at the federal level who are, believe it or not, beginning to watch for, um, and this is for secret and top secret clearances, they're starting to monitor um, uh, in real time, they're starting to take a look at uh, drops in your credit rating. Uh, whether or not you incorporate, whether or not you take travel to other areas of the world that, um, that you should probably report that you're going there before you go. Uh, so they wanna, they're pulling data out of LexisNexis and Dun & Bradstreet and all kinds of different places. So when you think about big data, you know, if you really want to go big, you can go outside of the activities as, um, as profiled based against a user's activities inside the network and where they surf to. All kinds of other activities are available to you if that's your bent, if that's what you need to understand uh, how an employee is going to behave when they handle personal data or private data. Um, and then finally, um, you know, determining what is normal and what is not really is uh, a function across all of IT, not just security, not just IT operations and application management, but really all of IT. Uh, so you want to be able to monitor um, uh, credentialed activity uh, that's not monitored typically by security systems. I, I want to be able to monitor uh, file, large file transfers. I want to be able to monitor um, surfing to domains that were only created in the last 24 hours. If they're newly created and I have people surfing to them, that's pretty much a tip off that, that the place they're surfing to is a, uh, is a command and control site. Um, so I want to make sure I can monitor those kinds of things. I want to be able to um, understand IT and security together because availability, again, is a security risk. And then I also want to look at um, insider threats across those boundaries uh, from uh, security to application management and apply statistical analysis and baselining uh, to those activities. What are the, uh, what URLs are people surfing that are uh, say 10 to 30 times longer than the statistical average over a week across my entire infrastructure. Those are the ones that likely contain command and control instructions in them. So performing statistical analysis and, bench and baselining uh, across IT operations data, across application data, across security data is a way to find out what's normal and what's not inside of your environment. Um, and that's probably the biggest takeaway um, that you can take with you if you leave with anything out of this room. It's using statistical analysis on your data, finding out what's normal and what's not. It's the most vexing problem that security people have. So uh, how much and what kind of data do we need? Um, you know, that depends on you. Uh, but I will tell you that I used to think of security relevant data as logs from, logs from uh, operating systems. Uh, firewall logs, intrusion detection logs, any virus logs, those kinds of things. But really, when you think about it, um, there are other logs out there that are really important. Um, I have perhaps GPS access to all of the state-owned vehicles. Um, I can begin to understand their travel patterns. I can begin to understand whether or not there's misuse of company or of state property uh, by doing that uh, with GPS data. I can take RFID information. Um, RFID tags are now widely used on all kinds of equipment uh, and understand whether or not that's being used in a way that, or obtained in a way or used in a way that it's supposed to be. I can pull together um, uh, IVR logs, uh, interactive uh, verbal response system logs. I can pull together all kinds of non-traditional data and use that in a security context. So really, the amount of data you, you need is the one that allows you to tell the best story of who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, and that 
is, if anybody's read the first paragraph in a newspaper anymore or even on a website in a news article, um, who, what, when, where, and why are the, are the top things, uh, those five questions are always answered in that first paragraph, or at least in most good journalistic practices they are, because they tell the entire story. And if you want to tell a security story, those five things have got to be in there. You need to understand those five things. Um, I, talked a little, I already talked a little bit about data reduction um, and the importance of what I call the data fat. You know, you don't want a, a skim milk version of security. You don't want a skim milk version of your data. You want to collect as much of it as possible and have it fresh and have it be fresh as possible you, because all data really is security relevant. I need to be able to collect data from uh, on uh, email, when something happened, how something happened, where something happened, who it happened, uh, who it, who it uh, involved, um, who the supervisor was, was that the proper thing for that particular person to be doing, uh, and, um, uh, and, and a variety of data that's, that's going to be important for me to tell that story. So we really need to move, big data is the right way to go, um, because we really need to move to a data inclusion model that will pull together lots of different combinations. And I can look to know what's right across the location of an individual, the role of that individual, the, the, the asset type, the criticality, the time of day something occurred, um, what occurred on that particular time, and how long something took. All of those kinds of things together, that's, that's my security story. This took longer than it should have. It came from Iran. This person was involved. And they're not, the, um, uh, they're not the director of the department. They're just one of the, the managers. They weren't supposed to be able to do that. All of that kind of information, role, how long something took, is extremely important in describing the whole story. And when you move to a, a single data inclusion model, you get basically a single data layer across IT operations, application management, um, compliance and audit, uh, basically, you have everybody doing their own thing with the data, but sharing the layer itself. Uh, and most big data solutions, like, like Splunk, for example, our solution, have good role-based access controls that can keep the separation between the departments, but all having, having them uh, ha making the data available so they can see their piece of the pie. They can see their piece of the puzzle and begin to understand how to work together to reduce agency risk. Um, I just want to want to give you sort of a, uh, a visualization as to, as to how, uh, how w this is not a commercial on Splunk necessarily, but I want to give you a visualization that lets you see how we let customers put uh, stories together. So I've got a number of different types of activities over on the left hand side in that far left column. Um, above that, at the very top, I have all of my asset information that I pulled from asset databases or Active Directory or a variety of different sources. And what I'm able to do is see these, uh, these things in sort of a swim lane uh, or different swim lanes for these different activities and then pull up a, a particular view of the data itself that's interesting and do visual correlations across the swim lanes to, to, uh, to figure out, yes, I had a particular event that occurred. Um, there was surfing to a malicious website, there was a change in authentication, there was a change in a file, all of them happened in about 15 minutes. That's worth investigating to me as a pattern. And I can select those different things and sort of put together on the right hand side my story of what occurred. Professor Plum did it in the parlor with the lead pipe, if any of you are familiar with the clue game. Uh, so it just makes it easy to sort of visualize um, what the threats are and then sort of explore those at the metadata layer and then go into the log data to under the raw log data to understand what's going on. Um, other use cases really briefly um, that we're finding is particularly in state and local government. For those of you who sat through the security presentation but aren't security people, thank you. Um, but uh, I want to give you just a little bit of, uh, of other use cases. Um, I already mentioned misuse of government property um, and this I borrowed from the commercial side because we have a a customer, uh, Disney, who has a, a lot of different um, uh, 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 lots that they shoot film on, uh, and some of them have um, uh, their own gas pumps. And what they did was they started looking to see if people were filling up their gas tanks uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the movie shoots and trying to figure out um, uh, whether or not people were just you know, filling up their personal vehicles and moving on with their lives. 
uh, and they were actually able to recover um, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, money. They deducted money from people's paychecks when they found out they were doing that. Um, the, the applications themselves, they couldn't change the applications, but they could get the log data. The applications were, were, were I think, al almost 10 years old. They were running these fuel, the, these, uh, these, uh, the, the two fuel farms that they had on their lots. Um, so they were actually able to monitor the usage and detect whether or not they were having, having fraudulent behavior. Um, crime hotspotting, um, uh, we have uh, police departments that are, that are doing statistical analysis that uh, deals with response times and criminal activity trends. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to take data from, from, uh, from a big data system and visualize it on a map to understand whether or not you've got particular crime levels in one area uh, more than in another what your measured response times are, whether or not reports are being uh, uh, created on time, um, all that kind of thing. So you actually can take big data and apply it in that particular way. Um, emergency services, this is, this is gathering GPS data from emergency service vehicles where you want to understand or pre-position for emergency services where those are. Um, so if I can, again, grab that GPS data, analyze it in a big data system, and I can then begin to say, spread that out over a map of the city and begin to understand that I've got where I've got my assets pre-positioned and then look for outliers, those assets that have not been assigned, and put those where they need to be. Big data is, can be used for that as well. I, recently we had, there were uh, quite a lot of, quite a, a bad flood in uh, Thailand. Uh, Bangkok historic floods um, across the city. And one of the uh, folks over there wrote an app uh, for Splunk that allowed them to monitor all of the different um, uh, stations, all the different water level stations, and begin to analyze how quickly it was taking water to move from one area of the country to another um, based on the data that they were collecting and to predict when floods were going to hit a particular part uh, of the city. Uh, so big data in emergency services uh, makes a lot of sense. And then finally, um, you know, mining social data. Uh, we have a variety of partners uh, who work with us, a company called DataSift, another one called GNIP. Uh, and what they do is they'll mine blogs, Twitter data, Facebook, anything that's public facing for information. And uh, in New York, in New York City, I know that they have a, uh, a, a Twitter program where you can tweet uh, potholes, uh, and, uh, and then begin to look at uh, where those are and dispatch crews to fix those. But what they are starting to do is take sort of the next step, which is when was the last time that was repaired? What crew was on shift that did the work? Who was in charge of the crew? What type of asphalt was used? All of those different pieces can be brought together to say, hey, this crew is underperforming. This product doesn't work very well. Um, you can begin to analyze the data in that way to understand beyond when, wh when and where you need to fix the next pothole to how do we actually provide services better. Um, and with that, I'll sort of show you that big data uh, can deliver uh, visibility across IT and security, um, security and compliance, application management, business analytics, web intelligence, um, all of those. And we really need to start looking at data as a whole and seeing it in lots and lots of context because the next types of attacks of the future are going to require uh, risk scenario thinking. In other words, I'm going to need to start thinking about, okay, if somebody wanted to steal all the, re all the records from, um, uh, you know, from, the, uh, from DMV, for example, how would they do that? Um, what kinds of data sources would they go after? How would they get in there? Form a hypothesis decide what data types would be useful, gather the, um, the subject matter experts on each of the different data sources to analyze what's in the data, and then decide what kind of analytics I'd want to run on the data to sort of figure out what's normal and what's not. So begin to put together risk scenarios. Um, they're going to grow in sophistication, uh, much more targeted uh, attacks, and they're going to be motivated, of course, by acquiring customer data, stealing intellectual property, uh, damaging the reputation of someone, uh, holding companies or state governments for ransom, uh, and then expand the scope of your data collection. Think outside, far out, as far outside as you can. Easier to think big and scale back than it is to start small and go back and go big. So think big. Start with that. 
and figure out what the scope of the data collection is you need to do to be able to, uh, to see this kind of thing. And then expand your mind to think in IT risk scenarios. Uh, and um, this is what the platform for big data for risk insight really is going to end up looking like, where I'm looking at business process data, system distribution data, or, or um, industrial control system data, application monitoring, security data, IT operations. And with that, um, I want to thank you for uh, letting me ramble on for a while. And if you have questions, I'll take them. Uh, if you like what you saw, tell everybody. If you didn't, don't tell anybody. Thanks. <clears throat>